Good afternoon, everyone. And the first item of business today is portfolio questions. And in order to get as many people in as possible, I'd be grateful for short questions and answers. Question one, Bob Doris. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it seeks to support Jewish culture in Scotland. Mr Humza Yusuf. I thank the member for the question. The Scottish Government recognises and values the contribution of Scotland's Jewish communities and that that they make to our nation. Most recently, we provided £10,500 to the Scottish Council of Jewish Communities to continue their Being Jewish in Scotland project to explore how attitudes of being Jewish in Scotland have changed over the past year. This is on top of £21,750 provided in 2011-12 to create a picture of contemporary Jewish life in Scotland. The Scottish Government also supports as the member will know, the annual commemoration of Holocaust Memorial Day uh, through a grant to Interfaith Scotland. Uh, and on the 27th of January, the First Minister attended the 2015 National Scottish Holocaust Memorial Day in Ayr. Thank you. Bob Doris. I thank the Minister for that extensive answer. Does the Minister agree that the celebration of Jewish culture is an expression of the tolerant and its inclusive Scotland that we all want to nurture? And will the Minister take this opportunity to pay tribute to the contribution of our Jewish communities who have made Scotland, who have contributed towards Scottish society and put on record our solidarity with them at a time of heightened anxiety due to the increase in anti-Semitic Semitic abuse and attacks. Mr. I, I thank the member for raising the, the important point, and we stand absolutely shoulder to shoulder with the Jewish community uh, here in Scotland, whose contribution is vast. Uh, we all know uh, that contribution has been economical uh, to, to our economy, it's been to our education sector, it's been social, it's been cultural, uh, and we should celebrate that. And all of us have a duty across this chamber, regardless of uh, which party we belong to, to, of course, stamp that out uh, wherever it exists. Uh, in terms of the actual attacks, uh, I should say to the member that I'm pleased to note, although, of course, there's a lot more work to be done, that there has been a 15% decrease uh, in anti-Semitic uh, uh, incidents. Uh, and that's been a 35% decrease from the year before. But still, uh, there is a heck of a lot to be done. And perhaps just the final point I'd make uh, on this is that uh, in a time of inflamed rhetoric around immigration and migration, it's important that all of us stand with one united voice to say that actually those who seek to divide us uh, should not be allowed to do so, not now, and indeed not in the future either. Excellent. Anne McTaggart. Thank you, President Officer. Can I ask the Minister... Um, how he seeks to support the Jewish culture within the education system in Scotland. Minister. Of course, uh, you know, religious education is a matter, matter for local authorities. Uh, but, of course, uh, there should be as much exchange of information as possible. I know when I was in school, certainly, it was an important part to be able to learn from other uh, Jewish pupils and from those uh, from the community directly. Uh, and I know Scottish Council for Jewish Communities do programmes where they actually go into schools, members of the community, and speak about uh, their different uh, traditions. So uh, you know, I'm more than happy, of course, to, to speak to the Minister and the Cabinet Secretary for Education to see uh, what is going on and to provide the, the member with a fuller answer. But the more we can promote that interaction between communities, uh, most certainly the better. Thanks. Question two, Richard Baker. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what proportion of Creative Scotland's project funding was spent in Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire in the last year, and how many projects in Aberdeen received support? The Secretary, Fiona Hislop. In 2013-14, Creative Scotland provided almost £1.8 million uh, pounds in 27 awards in the Aberdeen city area and almost £2.2 .2 million pounds in 30 awards in the Aberdeenshire area. This represents their total spend in these areas. Creative Scotland have advised it is not possible to identify the amount of funding which was project specific and to frame this as a proportion of total project spend. Projects supported include the Youth Music Initiative, support for artists and cultural venues including Aberdeen Performing Arts and North East Arts Touring which works in Aberdeenshire and more recently Creative Scotland has awarded £130,000 to the Sound Festival which is based in Aberdeen for its work in 2015-16. Thank you very much, Richard Baker. Independent analysis carried out by members of the arts community in the North East shows that per capita spend from Creative Scotland and Aberdeen was under £10, whereas in both Edinburgh and Glasgow it was over £50 per capita. Will the Minister agree that these figures show Creative Scotland should be doing more to support the arts in, in Aberdeen and the wider North East, particularly when there are many exciting projects to support, like the Youth Festival, like the Sound Festival, which the Minister mentioned, as well as our theatres, and what will she do to ensure there's more investment in the arts in the North East in the future? 
Permanent Secretary. Well, in 2013-14, uh, in relation to Aberdeen City, it ranked 14th for investment per head of population, so uh, mid-table in terms of ranking per head of population. And indeed, uh, for Aberdeenshire, um, it was 13th in 2013-14 per head of population. I think the analysis that he's referring to, which I haven't seen, is that analysis uh, probably reflects that there are there is funding for the national performing companies and collections, which are based in Edinburgh and Glasgow, Four of the five national performing companies are based in Glasgow, but you'd be pleased to know that when the Scottish Government's Cabinet was meeting in Aberdeen, I met with Aberdeen Performing Arts. I was delighted that they've now received regular funding, a major achievement um, for that, uh, that, that cultural body. And we were discussing the importance of the uh, companies in particular providing uh, support and performances, which they already do, but specifically during the period of the fantastic re renovation, again funded through uh, Scottish Government public bodies and agencies including Historic Scotland of the Music Hall. So yes, I, I recognise um, that there may be a disparity, but that will be due to, due to the national performing companies. But that is precisely why we insist as part of the, the government's relationship with the national performance companies that they perform as they regularly do in Aberdeen. That will not appear in the figures of the report that he has cited. Many thanks. Question, question three, Hans Alan Malik. Thank you very much and good afternoon, Presiding Officer. It's to ask the Scottish Government when it plans to announce details of the new film and TV studios in Scotland. Uh, as I stated in my evidence session at the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee on Wednesday the 4th of February, uh, Scottish Enterprise have received a new proposal to provide studio infrastructure for Scotland. This proposal is currently subject to a due diligence uh, and is commercial in confidence at present. Uh, however, I anticipate being able to confirm if this proposal is viable in April 2015. Uh, thank you very much for that response, and I, I'm grateful that there is some movement. Considering this, been, this issue has been going on for some years now, uh, with no visible progress, can the minister assure me that all necessary steps are being taken by the Scottish Government and the Scottish Film Studio Delivery Group to ensure and create a, a Scottish Film Studio? And when will we see real progress on the Glasgow site? Okay. In relation to Glasgow, uh, I, I would refer the member to my evidence where I set out quite clearly that in terms of propositions, you can't have a private sector tender when response from Glasgow uh, in sp specifically was for a 100% uh, publicly funded studio. However, I do absolutely recognise the skills and the existing infrastructure in Glasgow, um, and I have tasked the film uh, delivery group to look at different options further to the one that's been provided. Now, that uh, relies on the business coming through the, through the door. It relies on the economy and the opportunities. But can I say, when the Outlander starts to be broadcast in the, in the UK, I think people will see um, the importance of the film industry, the investment it can bring, but also uh, recognise that more can be done. And we already invest a record amount in the film industry, far more than compared to, to pre the previous administration. Uh, but there's much more that can be done. There's a huge potential. And I would you know, affirm to the, to the member my commitment and this government's commitment to the sector. Maxwell. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I was interested in Hans Malik's comments about uh, progress, and I just wondered, therefore, could the Cabinet Secretary outline the current level of Scottish public sector investment in the screen sector and how that compares with 2007-2008? Uh, uh, well, in terms of uh, support for the sector, what I can say is the current proposal is uh, £21 million. In relation to um, the previous administration, it was far, far less than that. Um, in terms of what that means, for example, Creative Scotland currently invests £8 million. Um, in terms of uh, set the sector, uh, in terms of the screen sector prior to that, I think it was about £3 million. So that's a big increase from £3 million to £8 million um, in terms of direct film subsidy. But in the film and television sector as a whole, uh, the total is now £21 million, which is considerable not just in film but also in television. Uh, and I think it's very important that in our focus currently on the film sector, we don't forget the television sector as well. Yep. Question four, Alison Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with representatives of the European Commission. Minister Humza Yousaf. The Scottish Government ministers and officials meet regularly with the European Commission to advance the government's agenda across a range of portfolios. For example, I met with officials from the Commission's Trade Directorate General on the 19th of February for a factual briefing on trade policy, which covered uh, a range of issues, amongst them TTIP. 
Alison Johnson. Thank you. I would indeed like to ask about the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. This deal risks much more than public services like the NHS. Westminster's Environmental Audit Committee pointed out yesterday that there are 1,300 cosmetic chemicals restricted in Europe compared with just 11 in the US. Does the Minister agree that TTIP will weaken our environmental and public health protections and will he write to the Commission and UK Ministers voicing opposition before the negotiations enter their ninth round in April? I appreciate the members' uh, concerns, Minister. TTIP, and many of those concerns are also shared uh, by this Government. Uh, that is why the First Minister herself has written to the Prime Minister outlining a number of those concerns. Those concerns include, of course, the NHS and public services, as she mentions, uh, ISDS, the issue of transparency around the negotiations, but also, as she quite rightly says, uh, maintaining standards and not lowering standards. Uh, we have had assurances, but until there is a final agreement, it's difficult to oppose TTIP without seeing a final agreement. So what we'll continue to do is put forward, of course, all our concerns, uh, put them forward in a constructive manner. Uh, and we have asked for very specific things within TTIP, for example, a black and white uh, exemption in the text of the agreement. Uh, that was signed by members of the Cabinet, indeed the First Minister, uh, again herself. So I'm more than happy to meet with the member. We have written to the Commission, we have written to the UK Government uh, on these matters. I can get her copies uh, of those letters and corresponding uh, responses where, where is appropriate. But uh, we are certainly in agreement that uh, TTIP or any agreement, uh, if there is an agreement, must be about uh, raising standards and not lowering standards. Claire Baker. Um, thank you, President Officer. The Minister may be aware of the Commission's proposed cuts to Horizon 2020, the fund which many Scottish universities benefit from. Um, can he say what representation the Scottish Government has made on this issue? Minister. I am aware of it. And uh, at the re recent meeting with uh, David Liddington, the UK Government's Minister for Europe, I raised uh, this specific point uh, and mentioned that if there's any uh, funds that are to be found for uh, President Juncker's investment package, that we would have serious concern if those funds were taken uh, from Horizon 2020 for exactly the reasons uh, that the member raises. It should be, to put it into context, uh, in terms of the money that was reduced from Horizon 2020, it was specifically for President Juncker's investment package. It could be that universities, and they should, be able to benefit from that. Uh, which I hope uh, in Scotland uh, they absolutely would. But yes, we, we share the concerns, and there should be, we would hope, no further reduction of Horizon 2020. Thank you. Jamie McGregor. Uh, thank you. What discussions has the Scottish Government had with the European Commission regarding its proposed energy union? Does the Minister agree with me that completion of such a union would help integrate Scotland into a pan-European energy market? Minister. Uh, Yes, I mean, I'm more than happy to give the correspondence and the discussions that we've had, including the discussions the Cabinet Secretary herself has had, and indeed any other uh, conversations. But yes, uh, we agree that, agree that there's, of course, uh, potential uh, benefits uh, for Scotland. And of course, that uh, is another good reason why Scotland most certainly should remain a member of the European Union. Mm. Thanks. Briefly, Neil Finlay. In uh, his discussions with the European Commission, did the Minister raise the economic and political situation in Greece, where we recently saw a government democratically elected by the Greek people in a manifesto to oppose austerity, only to be immediately prevented from enacting that manifesto by the Troika of the Commission, the IMF and the ECB. Why was there no uh, protest from the Scottish Government or from governments across Europe about this democratic outrage? Minister. I should say, when the Greek government uh, was elected and appointed into place, I was one to give a message. Uh, to the Prime Minister of congratulating him on getting into his position. I noticed that Ed Miliband didn't make a single comment in terms of congratulation to Syriza, and in fact was uh, hiding uh, away from that. Uh, in terms of our own voice in the European Union, of course, you'll be more than well aware, uh, because of the recent referendum, that that voice is represented by the UK Government. Uh, I wish that we had a greater voice. I hope that he'll support us in terms of our discussions, in terms of the Smith Commission, so that Scotland has a voice and can be a counterbalance, because there's no doubt, and he's correct, to, to make mention of this and to allude to this, that this government is anti-austerity, unlike, of course, the party that he represents. Many yeah. yeah. well, thanks. Question five, in the name of Jenny Mara, was not lodged and a less than satisfactory explanation was provided. Similarly, question six was not lodged and a less than satisfactory explanation was provided. Question seven, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the impact on devolved areas of responsibility of reported plans to replace the TV licence fee with a household tax. 
Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. Uh, there are no plans to replace the television licence fee with a household tax in the context of renewal of the BBC's Royal Charter for 1st of January 2017. That said, on the Thursday 26th of February, uh, the House of Commons Select Committee on Culture, Media and Sport published its fourth report, uh, Future of the BBC, in which they wrote that there currently appears to be no better alternative for funding the BBC in the near term other than a hypothecated tax or the licence fee, end unquote, end quote. But also looked uh, at the possibility, the report did, in the longer term of introducing a broadcasting levy applicable to all households. The Director General of the BBC, Lord Hall of Birkenhead, indicated in a speech to BBC staff on Monday the 2nd of March that he saw some merit in the idea of a broadcasting levy. Now, against a background where annual funding for BBC Scotland will have fallen from 102 million to 86 million by the time the Charter is renewed, the Scottish Government will be making the case for adequate resources publicly funded, reflecting that £320 million that Scotland contributes currently through the licence fee to produce the high quality programming that Scotland and deserves under any approach to funding. Okay. Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. And, uh, I recently conducted a survey in which 74% of the 1,600 constituents who replied agreed that broadcasting legislation should be devolved to this Parliament. Uh, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me uh, and my constituents that the, these powers should be devolved in order that we in this chamber can decide any changes or alternatives uh, to the TV licence fee and how that income is spent uh, and bearing in mind the comments that she just mentioned in terms of the £320 million that Scotland actually contributes but it's going to be reduced down to £86 million in which we receive. Uh, President Officer, uh, I do agree with that. Uh, in our submission to the Smith Commission, we made the case for devolution of broadcasting, including the licence fee, as part of a, a coherent package of reforms on a, a DevoMax model. It is disappointing, uh, although not the first disappointment, uh, that the Smith Commission outcome fell short of that. Uh, we will, however, use the formal consultative role for the Scottish Parliament that is proposed in renewal for the BBC Charter, uh, as I'm sure the Parliament will itself, uh, to press the case for more production for Scotland and from Scotland. Many thanks. Question 8, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support it has given to community arts groups across rural South Scotland in the last year. In 2013, Creative Scotland invested over £3 million in 94 awards to individual artists and organisations in South Scotland. These included support for the artistic programme uh, at the Boswell Book Festival, the Lammermuir Festival and the Alchemy Film Festival. In 2014-15, Creative Scotland had also awarded capital funding for Mopebrae uh, in Dumfries and Air Gaiety Theatre. Creative Scotland is also investing over £500,000 over the three-year period, 15 to 2018, in the Air Gaiety Partnership, the Stove Network Limited and the Wigtown Festival Company as regular funded organisations. Thanks. Claudia I thank Beamish. the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Lanark Memorial Hall, which is managed by South Lanarkshire Leisure and Culture Limited for South Lanarkshire Council, was able to offer the use of its box office for community group uh, Music in Lanark to support its production of Mud and, Bat Mud and Bat Butterfly. While this model was a relationship with a local authority, could the Cabinet Secretary give consideration to providing funding to support such ventures as this to ensure that communities have access to excellent venues across South Scotland and beyond, the cost of which is often beyond group's means? I think the member makes a very interesting point. There are sometimes skills and uh, uh, experience that can be shared more widely, and I think box office, back, backroom staffing, and in terms of administration, would allow a small amount to go an awful lot further. Um, and I, I, it is an area that I'm very interested in to help build capacity. It's also, um, I think, one of the areas that our national companies could also support in. So we have to look at the kind of network across Scotland to support the lifeblood of many local communities, which is a lot of the voluntary cultural work that takes, takes place and I'm sure members will have seen the, the Lanark um, exhibition that was here last week and commend the activities in that area. Many thanks. Uh, question 9, Claire Baker. Um, to ask the Scottish Government how much funding is available for the 2015 Edinburgh Festival's Expo Fund and when the details will be announced. Uh, I was delighted to announce uh, further investment of £2.25 million in support of the Edinburgh Festivals through the Scottish Government Edinburgh Festivals Expo Fund on the 6th of March. Uh, Scottish Government uh, Expo Fund investment has been transformative uh, for the festivals and their artists. It helps showcase them on an international platform and uh, you only have to look 
at the range of Scottish artists from Don Patterson, Ali Smith, James Robertson and of course Martin Creed and the Scotsman Steps to identify some of the, the, the uh, world class art that's being performed here and the Expo Fund has made a major contribution to that export of that international talent and the showcasing of Scottish cultural talent. Thank you. Claire Baker. Um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. And following the submission of my question last week, the Cabinet Secretary helpfully made the announcement on Friday, uh, so it's very welcome. Perhaps I can ask the Cabinet Secretary how we can support festival programmes in other cities. And while Edinburgh's programme is unique and international, how do we increase opportunities for other cities across Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Well, clearly the Edinburgh Festival is contributing £250 million to the local economy um, and also more widely. Uh, is a calling card, not just for Edinburgh, but for Scotland culturally. But she rightly identified and um, the role of other festivals. So, for example, Celtic Connections is a regular funded organisation from Creative Scotland, um, and there are other festivals that have that support. I'm delighted that St Magnus Festival, for example, in Orkney, similarly has such funding. So there is support for other festivals, um, and I think it's important that new festivals can also get support either from Events Scotland or Creative Scotland. So there are avenues in which we already support different festivals, but I am working with Visit Scotland um, as to how, with Visit Scotland, Events Scotland and Creative Scotland, we can make more of that wonderful offer all year round from the festivals throughout Scotland. Thank you. Um, disappointingly, question 10 in the name of Cara Hilton. Uh, there's been no explanation lodged for that question not being lodged. Um, infrastructure and investment in cities. Questions now. Question 1, Lewis MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government how it plans to contribute to the proposed city deal for Aberdeen. Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, we are always happy to consider new proposals and ideas to stimulate economic growth. We are working with Aberdeen City and Aberdeen Shire to establish a detail of what a city deal for the region is intended to deliver. Uh, we remain absolutely committed to working with all our cities to unlock investment, whether that is individually or collectively. Lewis MacDonald. I thank Mr Brown for that positive response. Can, he will be aware, of course, of the emphasis in the city deal proposal published this week on the need for improvements to rail infrastructure north and south of the city of Aberdeen. Does he agree that duelling the stretch of single track railway line at Montrose would strongly support the city deal proposals by linking in an enhanced rail network around Aberdeen with the central belt? Can he tell us if he does agree that that is significant when the government will make a decision on whether or not such an improvement should be included in its instructions to network rail for control period six starting in 2019? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, can I say, first of all, I think we all recognise, it's been recognised for a number of years now, the constraint which the Montrose Basin uh, uh, presents in relation to that, and it is a very substantial project in its own right. Um, I should say, first of all, in relation to the city deal, it's only right that, having received that just this week, that we take some time to look at the city deal, as you would expect us to do, to see where we can possibly work together and what we can support in relation to what's represented. But whether the Montrose Basin features in control period six will be a matter for discussion with myself and, of course, the Transport Minister and with officials. But that, of course, is something that I recognise as a long-standing ambition for people. It's also one of the ways in which we can achieve um, a substantial difference, both in terms of the capacity on that line and to, in terms of journey speeds as well. So, of course, it's something we wish to do at the earliest opportunity, but it will be have to set uh, beside other priorities at the same time, and a decision on that will be taken in due course. Thank you. Alison McInnes. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. As you would expect from a programme developed and championed by Liberal Democrats in the UK Government, city-region deals are designed to give local bodies greater control over spending and decision-making. After years of centralisation by this SNP Government, does the Cabinet Secretary consider this is an opportunity to start to reverse that unwelcome trend and initiate the transfers of powers from the Scottish Government back to local communities? Yeah. Secretary. I will certainly remember when I, as a council leader, had to spend uh, a very substantial chunk of our budget on uh, priorities set by the Liberal executive back in between 1989 and 2007. The biggest move towards decentralisation that we have seen is the lifting of hypothecated um, uh, expenditure by this government. That is a substantial move towards decentralisation and undermines her claim to be in favour of decentralisation. I think we have done a great deal to make sure that councils can spend according to their own priorities. I do accept, of course I do, that there have been constraints, not the least those which have been imposed by the government she supports in Westminster. We have a smaller cake to distribute, but we have looked after, in my view, local government. And as I said, we will take a very positive response to what we've been presented to by Aberdeen City and Aberdeen Shire in relation to the city deal. But we have to take some time to have a look at that, first of all. 
Hey, thanks. Question two, Jim Hume. Yeah, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what rail investment plans it has for South Scotland. Minister Derek Mackay. Over the next five years, the Scottish Government is investing £5 billion across the Scottish rail network, including in the south of Scotland, service improvements in Dumfries and Galloway, the introduction of the Great Scenic Railways on three lines, and investment of £353 million for the Borders Railway, which will establish passenger railway services between Edinburgh to Midlothian and Scottish Borders for the first time since 1969. Thanks. Uh, Jim Hume. I thank the Minister for his answer. Given the support of the Borders Rail project that, you mentioned, that he mentioned has, has received in the recent past from himself, of course, the former First Minister, and uh, Visit Scotland calling it a tourism magnet, does the Transport Minister agree with me and local campaigners that the Scottish Government should now take this chance to build on the work of the Lib Dems in coalition in passing that Waverley Railway Act and commission a feasibility study into the extension of the line onto Hoyke and beyond to Carlisle for the economic benefit that this would bring to even more communities across the borders? Minister? Well, it appears to me that the Liberal Democrats are living in some sort of parallel universe at the moment where they think their popularity is soaring. Well, we can all work together uh, across uh, the Chamber on Good Projects and the Borders Railway, I think, is a good example where people across the political spectrum have supported that project. We've said before, and we'll say again, that we will judge the success of the line and then take any future judgments on how that may be extended in the future. But if success of rail is anything to go by, it's exceeded the forecasts, and therefore rail has a very strong future in the portfolio uh, and transport uh, mix and I'm sure that the uh, Borders Rail will be a success and will continue to invest in the expansion of our railways and make all future judgments based on performance. Many thanks. Question three, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress is being made with the handover of the ScotRail franchise? Derek Mackay. It's significant progress continues to be made towards the handover from the ScotRail franchise to Abellio on the 1st of April. We expect a new franchise to build on the success of ScotRail, adding further quality and efficiency improvements to a rail network for passengers. In addition to the improvement commitments secured, we are also encouraged by the progress on the deep alliance with Network Rail, which we believe will improve partnership working on the railways to improve passenger experiences. Adamson. I thank the Minister for his answer. You mentioned the um, benefits to passengers. Can he confirm that the rail fares will not be subject to above inflation increases under the new franchise? Minister? Yes, we have secured uh, a fares arrangement that will ensure that peak fares are capped at the level of the retail price index and off-peak uh, capped at RPI less 1%. We will also have Club 50 smart card and reduce travel costs for job seekers and newly employed uh, people as well. So that fares policy is in addition to the station improvements, new trains, better digital infrastructure, smart ticketing, integrated transport, the great scenic railway, chupy protection for staff and improved journey times. That seems to me to be the best deal that was possible secured by this Scottish Government and that Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you very much. I have a huge amount of uh, supplementary question requests. I will start with Richard Simpson. Um, uh, one of the attendants told me that they are going to issue clogs on the 1st of May. Well, I am sure that is not true. <laughs> but whilst we all hope that this progresses well, can I remind the Minister of the current overcrowding at peak time uh, on the uh, Dumblain and Allawa routes from Glasgow and Edinburgh? Uh, and the record number of fines for reduced coach numbers that were, un were achieved under ScotRail, will he undertake to provide full information on what I'm told is the projected reduction in the number of coaches on the trains to Dumblain and Alloa when, uh, when the route to the borders opens? Sir. Well, I'm happy to look further at the detailed information, but overall there's no reduction in capacity. In fact, we want greater capacity in terms of uh, passenger numbers and, and, and so on uh, through the uh, procurement uh, of new trains that I'll be discussing with the Chief Executive of Abello later uh, today. Uh, and I'll also look to assess the new information we'll have. We'll be able to assess capacity numbers and overcrowding issues as well, and that will inform uh, further investment, indeed management of the rolling stock as well. So all of that 
should quite helpfully uh, um, provide us with a picture of where uh, further resources need to be deployed in partnership with Abellio. And I am happy to share that with uh, the member in due course. Many thanks. Alex Ferguson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Minister has been extremely helpful in trying to persuade Abellio to improve the train services that the company is offering my constituents in Stranra and in Wigtonshire, and the reintroduction of the early morning direct. Uh, train is, is very welcome. But I wonder if he might be able to sway De Bellio to include a direct service from, between Stranraer and Glasgow on, a, on Sundays, which would help to give my constituents the impression that they actually have a really meaningful service geared to their needs, rather than being felt as something of an afterthought in these negotiations. So. Well, I thank uh, Alec Ferguson for recognising the effort that I've put in to try and improve the service to and from Strand Ra, and that takes me to a point around consultation between the operator and communities. We shouldn't just consult with the existing travelling public, rail passengers, but more widely with transport partnerships, local authorities and potential rail users as well. And if we do that, then I think we can uh, helpfully shape services that people want. I have worked quite hard on the Strandra uh, Glasgow issue to improve connections. I think there will be uh, an improved uh, service, uh, better journey times and improved connections, and that uh, direct service is uh, restored as part of the current priced model. I am not sure if we can push much further on a uh, cost-neutral basis, but I am happy to look into that in terms of the question on the Sunday option as raised by the member. Finally and briefly, John Wilson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome the comments by the Minister in relation to the discussions with Abellio. But can the Minister give us some assurances that the rolling stock will not be affected? Because, I, as I am aware, the new rolling stock that Abellio has promised will not be in place until 2017. Can the quality and the age of the carriages that passengers are currently being asked to utilise be improved prior to that date? Minister? Well, we will uh, work uh, closely with, through Transport Scotland uh, with Abellio in terms of the, the new and existing stock. I can give the assurance that on transition, on handover, there is an adequate amount of trains to provide the service that is proposed. But it surely has to be welcomed, the multi-million pound investment that will bring new uh, electric trains to the network, of course, running in our newly uh, electrified uh, lines as well. That will ensure there are better journey times, improved service, better passenger uh, experience, and it has massive environmental benefits uh, as well in terms of emissions. So we will welcome this uh, new fleet, which will be uh, deployed from 2017 uh, onwards in a managed way, but that will significantly enhance the rolling stock that we have in Scotland. And the way we've produced the deal as well gives the Scottish Government the option to retain them, which is a novel approach in terms of the procurement of rail stock in uh, Scotland as well. Excellent. Question for Colin Beatty. To ask the Scottish Government what investment will be made in active travel using the future transport, transport fund. Minister. The budget, the budget for the future transport fund in 2015-16 is £20.25 million. Decisions on the allocations, including to active travel, are still to be taken, and an announcement will be made in due course. I thank the Minister for his response. Uh, the Minister will be aware of the Borders Railway project, which goes through my constituency. Can the Minister outline the ways active travel will be promoted through the railway? Minister? Well, we'll work very closely with Abelio, who has some experience uh, with uh, active travel uh, and cycling, uh, of course. Uh, to, to bring some of that expertise uh, to Scotland. In terms of the new contract, there will be the new franchise, there will be enhanced capacity, there will be uh, more bike schemes at local stations, uh, and as well as that, better information and integrated transport. But through a range of different funds as well, as including the Future Transport Fund, I hope to be very supportive of uh, cycling uh, and active travel uh, going forward, and I'll make some spending uh, announcements in due course. Excellent. Question five, Trish Ferguson. To ask the Scottish Government whether it considers the charrette process an effective means of investing in the development of cities and what support accompanies it. Minister Mark Abiyaji. Charettes provide opportunities for local people and public and private sector bodies to participate collaboratively in decisions relating to their communities. 
We believe that the charrette process is an effective and efficient means of investing in the development of Scotland's cities, towns and rural areas. Since 2011, we have allocated grants and provided advice to support the delivery of 31 charrettes across Scotland, including seven in our cities. I thank the Minister for that information and I would agree uh, with him in his assessment of it. He will know that two very well attended and ambitious charrettes have recently been held in my constituency. And local groups and organisations, as well as many individuals and agencies, worked very well together to develop a series of coherent and dynamic ideas that will help to shape the future of Spears Wharf and Hamilton Hill and have the potential to be transformational for those communities. So can the Minister advise me if the Scottish Government will invest in the opportunities that are identified through the charette process? I would thank the, the member for the question and I have to say I was at the uh, Woodside Fir Hall and Hamilton Hall charrette on its final day and I saw the outputs from the collaborative process and I was very impressed by the, the level of vision that there was but also the connection uh, with uh, some, some ideas that people just sitting in the offices behind their desks might not have, have been able to come up with. The, the two charrettes were set up as a local development plan charrettes, so the aim for these charrettes is to create supplementary guidance for the Council as part of the overall uh, regeneration of uh, those areas. And that is something that obviously the Scottish Government will be, be keen to participate in. I, I think it is fair to say that the, the best charrettes are where there is a desire to regenerate, there is some resource behind it, and indeed uh, some movement taking place so that the vision can be uh, devised that uh, people and uh, agencies can then put into place. Many thanks. Question six, Jamie McGregor. Um, thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to alter speed limits on trunk roads in the Highlands and Islands. Okay. We have recently updated the findings of the speed limit review and remain committed to improving safety in our network by delivering speed limit reductions where these are justified as part of our wider programme of road safety measures. The updated findings of the review support our decision not to progress with the proposed speed limit reductions in five locations across the network, including two on the A87, a further two on the A95 and one on the A84. We will continue to engage with communities in promoting road safety across Scotland and welcome the comments and responses received during the course of this engagement. I have given a fuller response to a parliamentary answer on the 6th of March as to matters of process. Well, I, I thank the Minister for that answer, but I have been contacted by a number of Argyle constituents, including local business people, who are opposed to Transport Scotland's proposal to reduce the speed limit on the A83 trunk road between Tarbot and Ardrishig to 50 mph. Local businesses have expressed the view that this proposed reduction is not based on concrete evidence and that it, will reduce, that it will reduce accidents and that instead it will increase driver frustration while slowing down journey times and reducing the area's economic competitiveness. Surely an improvement to and widening of parts of this narrow road would be a more effective solution. Will the Minister undertake to look into this issue and address the concerns of Argyle residents and businesses? Minister. Uh, yes, of course. I will consider the matter closely. And that is exactly why, when other members have raised the speed limit, proposed speed limit uh, reductions, I have had a look at the, the data and the case to ensure that it is justified. And it just goes to show the level of engagement and consultation uh, that we have had. Sometimes we can change our mind if the case uh, is made. But safety in all of this will be paramount and we will have the appropriate speed limit uh, that the uh, circumstances and the geography and the topography uh, allows uh, as well. Uh, and finally, on resources, of course we will want to address more of the road network in terms of additionality to the commitments we have made. But I tell you from a Conservative, it would have been so much better if our capital budgets hadn't been reduced as a consequence of the decisions of the party that Mr McGregor is a member of. Dave Stewart, briefly. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Does the Minister share my view that the HGV 50 mile an hour pilot on the A9 has been an excellent initiative? Has there been any early feedback from the police, hauliers and road safety organisations about how effective the pilot has been in practice? Minister. All the evidence we have today is that the 
package of measures on the A9 has been a success, and that's a mixture of the average speed cameras, the changes to the speed limits, the wider campaign about driver behaviour as well. And for those reasons, excessive speeding is down, speeding, average speeding is down. And when we look at the, the number of road incidents as well, and the fullness of time, uh, then we can make a further judgment. But in terms of HGV speed limits as part of that package, it does seem to be a success, and it's been welcomed by all of the partners uh, involved. As to the wider issue of changes south of the border, we'll take an evidence approach whether that's relevant here, but it strikes us that as part of the package of measures on the A9 it's worked, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that should be deployed across the country. Question 7, Stuart Maxwell, if we can do it briefly, please. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with local authorities regarding the Glasgow and Clyde Valley city deal. Right. The Scottish Government agreed in August 2014 to contribute half a billion pounds over 20 years to support a deal for Glasgow and the Clyde Valley that empowers the Glasgow and Clyde Valley partners to identify, manage and deliver projects which will stimulate economic growth and create jobs in their area. The Glasgow and Clyde Valley partners are developing an assurance framework that will ensure their investment decisions are based on sound business cases and that projects will be delivered effectively. The assurance framework will respect local decision making and must be approved by both UK and Scottish Government ministers before any funding is released. Officials are continuing to work closely with Glasgow and Clyde Valley and the UK Government to finalise the assurance framework. Thanks, Stuart Maxwell. And thank you. Uh, can the Cabinet Secretary confirm how the Glasgow and Clyde Valley City deal will ensure that the benefits derived from the economic growth will be spread not, across, not just across Glasgow but also across the entire Clyde Valley region, including the most deprived areas? In the terms of the deal are very clear. The deal empowers the Glasgow and Clyde Valley partners to identify, manage and deliver projects which will stimulate economic growth and create jobs in their area. And the deal also specifically states that it will spread the benefits of economic growth across Glasgow and the Clyde Valley, ensuring deprived areas benefit from this growth. So the Scottish Government and the UK Government have been working with Glasgow City and its partners in the development of the assurance framework, which will ensure that investment decisions taken by Glasgow City and Clyde Valley partners are based on sound business cases and that projects will be delivered effectively. Many thanks. And that concludes portfolio questions for today. And we now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 12591 in the name of Jackie Bailey.